Good morning, afternoon, or evening. I'm Colonel Randy Pugh. I'm the Senior Marine Corps Representative here at the Naval Postgraduate School and the Deputy Director of the Naval Warfare Studies Institute. Welcome to today's Sea Power Conversations, hosted by MPS's Naval Warfare Studies Institute. If you're new to the Sea Power Conversations, these are informal presentations and dialogue on topics of importance to the Naval Warfighters. The Sea Power Conversations, like NWSI itself, are a tribute to the late Captain Wayne Hughes, an MPS professor and author of Fleet Tactics. Right now, I'd like to turn it over to Vice Admiral Retired Ann Rondeau, the president of the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, thank you, Randy, and welcome everybody to this important event and this event that brings knowledge uh, and, and experts in one room and talking about these important things. We are in a new era of what they call great power competition, but it's an era where we truly have competitors who are equal to us, and in some cases better than us, than we are. And that's the important point now is what to do about that. And so we now have this tremendous period of time where the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard as maritime services in, in this nation and brilliant maritime services can come together and talk about and the cognitive age. Naval leaders of the 21st century must be three things. Highly proficient in our war fighting areas, capable of integrating their units capabilities and in and into the larger joint force and three knowledgeable about current and emerging technologies and the associated uh, capabilities and limitations uh, for us and for our adversaries. The foundation of our force development and design efforts and the operations start with war fighting concepts and indeed philosophically why we fight and of course conceptually how we will fight. And this is the North Star that guides everything else and therefore is incredibly important to get right. My own past is that I was one of the many contributors to the maritime strategy. I know how important this work is and I compliment the team that has come up with a tri-service maritime um, strategy. This is really important work and it sets us on a path that is really important for us all. So I look forward to hearing the conversations today and about how applied research, how, this, how the intelligent people that we have can all come together in one place, aligned to the highest priorities of the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, where steel to steel is being met in mind to mind. Colonel Pugh, back over to you. Thanks, Admiral. Before I hand it over to Captain Sunfall, just one administrative comment, and that is for those that are watching the streaming version of this presentation, uh, there's an area where you can type questions in uh, for the uh, presenters, and the co-host and I, Captain Sunfall and I, will uh, will grab those questions and uh, and ask them of the panel on your behalf. So please, if you have questions, type them in, and uh, and we'll ask them as many as we can before we run out of time. With that, Captain Sunfall, over to you. Hey, thanks, Colonel Pugh. Uh, good day, everyone. I'm Captain Dan Sunvold, the Surface Warfare Chair and Navy Deputy Director of NWSI here at NPS. <clears throat> it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. First up will be Navy Captain Matt Culp. He is a Naval aviator who started his career as a Hornet pilot and later transitioned to the Super Hornet. He is a Top Gun graduate and commanded the Black Knights of VFA-154. Captain Culp currently serves in the Pentagon as the Deputy Director of Navy Strategy, OPNAV, and 7. Next, Coast Guard Commander Kate Higginsbloom has held a variety of operational roles, including Command Center Chief and SAR Mission Coordinator for Sector Virginia, Incident Management Chief for Sector Boston, and Commanding Officer of the Cutter Baranoff. Commander Higginsbloom leads the creation of interagency and service-wide strategies in the U.S. Coast Guard's Office of Emergence, Emerging Policy. Our final speaker is Marine Corps Colonel Rob Schutcher, an infantry officer. He commanded the 4th Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion and later served as the officer in charge of all MARSENT coordination elements and the Central Command AOR. 
Colonel Sucher is the branch head for both the strategy branch and the national war plans branch at headquarters Marine Corps. Over to Captain Culp to lead us off. All right, thank you very much. Well, first off, I wanted to thank uh, Admiral Rondeau, Captain Sunvold, and Colonel Pugh for your very kind introduction to, to all three of us. Uh, I know I speak for both Colonel Rob Setcher and uh, Commander Kate Higginsbloom when I say it's, it's a great pleasure to get to talk to all of you. Uh, Rob and Kate and I spent really the last year leading the development of Advantage at Sea and leading a pretty large team amongst the tri-services to negotiate this strategy, talk about the ideas, and try to put them all down on paper, and ultimately try to get this thing to the finish line. So we've worked very closely <laughs> together over the last year, so it's always a great a great time to get together with, uh, with the two of them uh, to get to talk strategy instead of um, bashing our heads against the wall, trying to get this across the finish line. So uh, we, throughout that process, we obviously had uh, incredible conversations, occasional negotiations, uh, every once in a while a, a small argument, but we became great friends throughout the uh, the process. And I think the relationships that we built and between the three of us and then the team at large really helped us get this uh, get this strategy to the finish line for the three services. Uh, we certainly all wish we could be there in person, uh, particularly if we could join you all for a, a beer afterwards, but, but here we are in various basements and living rooms uh, around the world uh, but hopefully we can be there in person. Uh, our goal for this evening is to give you uh, not only an overview of what Advantage at Sea says and what the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy is, is driving the services toward, but also try to give you a little bit of insight into the thinking that went uh, into the writing of it and the drafting of it. Um, and then ultimately, we'll talk about what it means for the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard moving forward. And then we'll look forward to your uh, good good questions at the end to give you whatever insight that we can give uh, as the writing team for, uh, for this document. All right, next slide, please. All right, so... For the development of the strategy, this started about about a year ago when the three uh, service chiefs, the the relatively new uh, CNO Admiral Gilday, uh, and then the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Commandant of the Coast Guard, got together and said, "You know what? It really is time to update a, a tri-service strategy." And it seemed like a ripe opportunity to do so with the new CNO and uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps having just released his very well received Commandant's planning guidance. And really, the tasking we were given at the beginning was essentially four main uh, four main points. The first thing was there was this recognition that uh, certainly budget pressures would be imminent. Uh, ultimately, there would be a new Congress coming in in 2021, and the Navy needed a narrative of uh, not only the Navy but the naval service at large. Which, when I say naval service, I mean Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard all together. Uh, but we needed a value proposition of what the naval service brought the nation. Uh, so that was part one. And then part two was that the security environment had significantly changed since 2015. We had a new national defense strategy, and certainly the security environment had evolved with the rapid maritime growth of China in particular. So we needed to update that security environment and really clearly articulate what the world looks like now, uh, which obviously dovetails very closely into the first problem of, hey, you know, what is, what is it that the naval service is really, what is it for? Um, and those two things together, I think, tell a very powerful story. We also needed to get unity of effort between the, the three services in the employment of naval forces and also try to get unity of effort with our allies and partners uh, globally. And this couldn't only be focused in on the high end. We needed to really cover the full competition continuum for the employment of naval forces. Uh, and then ultimately, once you can understand, hey, what is it that we want to use naval forces for to achieve our national objectives, that helps you codify what are the naval force development priorities? Uh, what is it that we are going to organize, man, train, and equip um, within our services? So the service chiefs uh, have broad ability to do so um, in the sense that uh, although they're not COCOMs who are responsible for that global employment of the force, uh, as service chiefs, they're sitting members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and they provide their best military advice for how forces are going to be employed. And then of course, they are responsible for the organized main man train and equip functions under Title 10. Uh, that's at least for the Navy and the Marine Corps. For the Coast Guard, uh, the Commandant uh, essentially wears both hats. So it's a little more, um, 
a, a little more straightforward. But these these two roles, I think, are important to understand because some folks argue that a, a service strategy really should not talk too much about force employment. Uh, but we thought, A, first of all, the role exists. Certainly the service chiefs have the authority to talk about that with that JCS role. But really more importantly, you need a clear picture of what is it the forces need to be used to do in order to um, really come up with a compelling uh, a compelling force development strategy. The audience of the strategy was, was a challenging one. Uh, we started this effort pre-COVID, and so we recognize there's a variety of audiences that you need to hit with a service strategy. First, there, of course, there is the service itself. Uh, we need to talk to the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard um, to, to address those issues that I talked about for employment and developing the force. Of course, Congress is another primary audience. Allies and partners are another audience. The American people are an audience. And then, of course, you need to pay attention to the fact that your adversaries are also going to be listening to this as well. So initially, we had planned on three documents. It was going to be a classified document, a secret version that was then releasable to some of our allies and partners, and then the unclassified strategy. COVID started to change the... Um, the arithmetic on what we wanted to ultimately produce. Uh, the cooperation on the, the classified uh, became a little bit difficult for a few months. So for a short period of time, we shifted gears to really focusing on the unclassified strategy. And then as the more we discussed it and debated it, that ultimately really ended up leading the development effort. And we thought, hey, this can be a very powerful document because by leading with an unclassified document, uh, we were really asking the hard questions. What can we say in an unclassified setting to really help generate that unity of effort, which we think is critical uh, in this current security environment. So that's a very quick background on, on what ultimately led to uh, the launching of this development effort. Next slide, please. All right. So Advantage at Sea fits in between our national guidance and our service guidance. Uh, so, of course, we start with the national security strategy that goes down to the national defense strategy. And then on the right hand side of the slide, you have the individual service guidance. Uh, the CNO recently released his NAV plan. Uh, of course, the Commandant's planning guidance and the Coast Guard strategic plan had were already out when this document uh, development effort started. But what was missing was how do you link the national guidance to these individual service guidance? To how do we tie the three services together? And so that was really the goal of Advantage at Sea was to have one document that linked those three service, uh, the three services individually together under one collective strategic effort. Next slide, please. So next, I'm going to run through the security environment as we try to outline in, in the strategy. First of all, the strategy addresses the global competition with China and Russia. So it's important to recognize that this is not a regional strategy. This is a global look at everywhere that naval forces um, operate. So this is a global competition with China and Russia where fundamentally we see the free and open international order being challenged by these two competitors. Uh, and that's an important thing to keep in mind as we move forward here in this discussion. China and Russia in particular, this is not just a military competition. They're using all dimensions of national power and increasingly so as we move forward. So uh, obviously this is a service strategy, so we can't leverage all of the levers of national power within the strategy but we need to build those tie-ins. So the umbrella needs to be large enough where other elements of national power can see themselves, how they can throw their weight behind this thing, and we can generate a little bit unity of effort across the interagency. The security environment has changed certainly for the Naval Service in the sense that um, the seas, which for many years we've imagined as these huge strategic moats for the nation, um, and largely opaque areas for us to operate are really changing, where you have this proliferation of advanced sensors where the, the cost of having pretty, pretty good situational awareness is getting lower and lower. And so these battle spaces really are persistently surveilled. So we need to operate in a domain now where we essentially need to assume that we, that our adversaries and competitors probably know where our forces are. On top of that, you have this pr proliferation of long range precision weapons that make anti-access and area denial uh, much more effective. Uh, and then as we look to the future, you have a convergence of a number of new technologies. So you think artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, bioengineering, sort of you name it. Um, any one of those technologies 
have a pretty significant chance of changing the security environment alone. But when you combine them together, the effects really could be multiplicative. So it's hard to really hard to predict with these convergence of technologies how quickly and how the security environment are going to change. So that's going to be important context for all of us to keep in mind over the next decade. And then, of course, as we launch the effort, COVID-19 hits the global stage. And certainly that's going to be a disruption that we'll need to pay attention to if it's going to affect uh, budgets for all nations moving forward. The recovery from that is still a bit of a question mark. Uh, and then will there be future pandemics? Is this a new uh, a new environment that we're going to be living in moving forward? And then, of course, terrorism has not gone away. Uh, we pay less attention to it these days. It's certainly not at the front of the news cycle, but something that we can't forget about. So ultimately, we were challenged to come up with what is the problem statement? What is this the problem, the strategy? is trying to solve. And so it's in the blue box, but essentially what we came up with was the problem is essentially it's a two-pronged problem we are facing. First of all, China and Russia have these revisionist approaches that are below the threshold of armed conflict. They're undermining alliances and partnerships, and they're degrading that free and open international order, which is really responsible for the collective security and prosperity that we've enjoyed since the end of World War II. At the same time, there's this aggressive naval growth and modernization. So these military advantages that the U.S. has enjoyed for a long time are also eroding. So somehow we need to find a way to not only uh, ensure we can maintain our military advantage for high-end conflict, but how can we more effectively compete against these activities below the threshold of armed conflict? And ultimately, uh, if we do not do something about this, we're going to be really hard challenged to ensure we can maintain our advantages over the next decade. Next slide. All right, so here is an example of how the, uh, the rapid military growth is really affecting us. So this is the, the, the PLAN, the People's Liberation Army Navy, and how quickly their capacity is growing. So this is surely a numbers chart. It doesn't necessarily talk about the capabilities, but as they say, quantity has a quality all of its own. So you can see from 2000, uh, the PLAN was just over 100 ships. And by 2030, we're expecting that to be over 400 ships. So I mean, an unbelievable increase over just three decades. Um, but that's only part of the problem because the PLAN is only part of the issue. Of course, the Chinese, the China Coast Guard, uh, additional platforms that are certainly have military capabilities of their own. And then we have this maritime militia, which are civilian vessels, or at least they're disguised as civilian vessels, but really are state sponsored. These numbers are a little bit squishy and so tougher to, to project what these numbers actually are, but certainly do significantly alter the security environment, particularly in this day to day competition. The other thing that complicates this is that while the U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, and the Marine Corps have to take the platforms that we have and globally deploy them, these forces are largely concentrated in the South China Sea. Um, although China certainly is looking to expand their reach through things like the Belt and Road Initiative, but uh, certainly it's a home game for them and they have the advantage of being able to concentrate these forces uh, much, more, uh, uh, much more intensively than we can in the United States. Next slide. All right, so kind of understanding that background, what are the implications for the Naval Services here uh, with that really brief overview? First of all, uh, alliances and partnerships are our key strategic advantage. When you look at this as a global competition and potentially a global fight, we simply just do not have the capacity to handle this alone. We need alliances and partnerships to do this. On top of that, we enjoy a network of alliances and partnerships that uh, our authoritarian rivals absolutely do not. So those serve as a key asymmetric advantage to us as well. So it's something that we need to keep at the forefront and we'll talk about a lot within this strategy. It's really central to our strategic approach. Um, I think there's also a mindset shift that we need to think about as a, as a service. Certainly in our conversations, we did run into people who said, you know what, if allies and partners aren't gonna be putting warships and platforms and people 
inside the the threat um, environment where you know they're potentially fighting alongside of us, it's not worth investing in these relationships. And I think that's a very narrow view of things because as we mentioned, if this uh, first of all, if a fight does kick off, this is going to be global, and so it involves much more than just operating in that narrow, that small area, which would be a regional focus. Um, so as it expands globally, you need all kinds of different uh, assistance in terms of you still need to maintain maritime security. You've got long logistics lines you need to secure. Um, you need to deter opportunistic aggression um, incredibly importantly because this is not a bipolar problem. This is a multipolar world now. So alliances and partnerships help do all of that um, in a high-end conflict. And then most importantly in the day-to-day, this network of alliances and partnerships helps helps build deterrence. Uh, it helps build all of your military advantages, and they add extra capacity and capability that we can't do alone. So these really are alliances and partnerships are central. And so it uh, for for those folks who are trying to exclude the al- allies and partnerships from these conversations, um, I think it's something that we need to address within the services. On top of that, these activities short of war truly are achieving strategic level effects. The the island building that we see in the South China Sea, I think, is just the most obvious example of that. There certainly are others. But if we don't do a job, a more effective job um, pushing back on this day-to-day competition, we are going to find that the security environment is slowly changing to the point that it's very dis- disadvantageous towards the United States. So we need to stop seeding ground in the day-to-day. In order to do so, in order to prevail in this competition, this is not just a conception challenge. Uh, we chose this language specifically because there are some guidance documents out there that talk about how high-end conflict is a capability challenge and competition in the low end is really a conceptual challenge. I think that's broadly true, except for the fact that I think that limits our thinking and to think um, with the mindset of, hey, we're just not thinking hard enough about how you compete. When in fact, as we looked into it, uh, we really started to see that there are some capability things that we need to uh, bring to bear. There are probably some investments we need to make in the day-to-day in order to more effectively compete. Certainly operating forward is is critical. Uh, we can't do this from a distance. You can't uh, shore up alliances and partnerships, and you can't deter if you're operating thousands of miles away. So uh, certainly for the Naval Service, being there is critical. Um, contested seas require renewed emphasis on sea control. The security environment has certainly changed in the sense that when I have, you know, for my JO days serving as an F-18 pilot, it was pretty much accepted. You pretty much drive the aircraft carrier wherever you wanted. We were launching strikes um, into, uh, of course, Iraq and Afghanistan and operating all over the world. And there wasn't a lot of consideration about, hey, was there a threat to the carrier strike group? Um, Certainly as we move forward, that is obviously Uh, rapidly changing. So it's not suddenly that sea control is important when it wasn't before. Sea control has always been important. We've just been able to assume that we had it. But now uh, it is now contested. So sea control becomes the cost of entry for doing all of our other missions in order to project power, in order to maintain maritime security, in order to conduct sea lift, we need to maintain sea control in order to do those other functions. And then in order to do this, all of this is underpinned by the need to modernize, particularly when you're faced against competitors like China who are uh, modernizing and growing as rapidly as they are. So that's a quick survey of the security environment, and I will turn it over to Commander Kate Higgins-Bloom. She's going to talk through the five broad themes of the strategy. Kate, over to you. Thanks, Speaker. I'd also, uh, before I get started, I'd love to echo uh, Speaker's words of thanks to uh, Admiral Rundo and Colonel Pugh and, and Captain Sunbold for hosting us tonight. This is really, it's an august group and it's a great opportunity uh, for us to to hear from a lot of the people who will be implementing these strategies in the future and, and writing the next batch uh, in the not too distant future. And, and as Beaker said, it really was a, a team effort and considering not just how hard it is to write a strategy in general, but to write an integrated tri-service one during a global pandemic, uh, including I think three days in Beaker's living room when we couldn't go to the Pentagon. <laughs> um, so uh, really would like to echo uh, everything that, that was already said there. If I could get the next slide, please. So these implications, if you, kind of draw them out to their natural next step, 
led us to create five themes that run throughout the strategy. And the first of those um, is generating integrated all domain naval power. Then there's prevailing in day-to-day -day competition, controlling the seas, strengthening alliances and partnerships, and then modernizing the force. Uh, we'll go into each of these in just a little bit more detail. I'll try not to repeat too much of what was said before uh, as we fleshed out what those implications were of our operating environment. Um, next slide. So the first being the need to generate integrated all domain naval power. And the concept of integration really, as you look at a resource constrained environment, uh, is to put the right assets against, against the right risk or the right threat at the right time. You know, the, the desire here is to avoid, you know, from the Coast Guard's perspective, let's say, uh, trying to create a Navy light, that the Coast Guard should really be specializing and leaning in where it has the competitive advantage which enables Navy to invest where it needs to invest, Marine Corps to, to invest where it needs to invest, and then to synchronize those capabilities, capacities, roles, investments, and authorities to really address both the, the global threats that we face and recognizing some of those really focused regional challenges, particularly uh, you know, in priority theaters like the Indo-Pacific. And the, the end result of that would be to expand our ability to really operate across the continuum of competition. Uh, and as we embarked on this, one of the sort of repeated phrases for us was that competition was generally an under theorized space, that we had a lot of ideas and words for how to talk about the high end uh, and conflict in particular. And, you know, almost a year later, it's still slightly, it's still under theorized, but we're making progress. Uh, An integrated force is what helps us fill that gap. Next slide. Next is strengthening alliance and partnerships. They really are the strategic center of gravity uh, uh, and, and really are key in many ways. So one of the focuses of the strategy is this day-to-day -day competition and Beaker had already touched on it, but the concept of you know, combat credible forces is incredibly important. But in day-to-day -day competition, so many of those partners are, are partners who are uh, maritime in nature and are generally very vulnerable to coercion for a variety of reasons. And those partnerships may never result in uh, combat forces, but when you're looking at maintaining a really resilient rules-based uh, order, particularly in the maritime domain, uh, where so much of the, uh, the world's commerce is carried out, uh, it's incredibly important that we partner with the right um, service. Again, that's where that integrated force comes to mind. So. Uh, Dr. Tallis, a scholar from CNA, had often said the system is the prize in competition, and that is the truth. So those allies and partners really make up the fabric of the rules-based order that we're trying to defend. And then there's the obvious benefits from a practical sense, which are you know, improved intelligence, MDA, and operational capacity. Next. Next slide, please. All right. So prevailing in day-to-day -day competition is one of the themes that uh, was perhaps the newest and the most explicit uh, change for all, I think all the services in some way, which is really that day-to-day -day competition uh, is not sort of, you'll, you'll see that the word gray zone is not in there <laughs> or uh, low intensity conflict is not in there, that, that it really is day-to-day -day competition and that this strategy really is designed to confront both China and Russia's preferred option, which is to achieve their goals in the day to day without ever getting to conflict. And so we need to, you know, sort of get off the bench uh, in, in that day to day space and operate uh, with the intent of really pushing back and not uh, being uh, almost risk overly risk averse. And this has the second order impact of showing that our, our allies and partners, that we are reliable allies and partners on the things that matter to them. A lot of Coast Guard engagement with partners all over the globe really focus on these day-to-day -day incursions, things like um, fisheries that are being poached by state-sponsored illegal fishermen, uh, which don't really factor into uh, the high-end conflict calculus, but are really important for that day-to-day -day maintenance of the rules-based order that we all count on. This is also where the strategy is particularly maritime versus naval in nature 
which is so much of competition is really about market power. <laughs> and in order to compete, we have to have a, a healthy economy and a robust economy. And so much of that relies on a really stable and predictable maritime transportation or marine transportation system. And, and that's part of what we do in that day to day competition. Next slide. And controlling the seas. Beaker really talked about this very eloquently, so I won't uh, belabor it too much. But one of the biggest changes in the environment here is that uh, we're looking at threats and challenges uh, that are very different from the ones from the last 20 years. You know, when we were all engaged in, you know, essentially a conflict where we were optimizing to get to CENTCOM and you could DHL your spare parts if you needed to. And, and that's really not necessarily going to be the reality in the future. So you know, we need a force that can both control the sea and just assure access as a critical enabler for other missions. And to do that, we're going to use combined distributed fleet operations that require mobile expeditionary formations, both ashore and at sea, that can do both sea control and denial. And this is going to require a sweeping transformation um, of the Coast Guard, but also I, of the Marine Corps. Sorry, <laughs> not the Coast Guard. One of our takeaways from this is that you don't need a different Coast Guard, you just need a bigger Coast Guard. Uh, whereas there's going to be a lot of transformation uh, going on inside the Marine Corps and, and in part in the Navy uh, as we move towards this. Which gets me to the last theme, which is modernization. Uh, if we could get the next slide, please. Thank you. So modernizing the future force. There is a lot packed into this theme, and I'm, I'm grateful I'll be handing it off to Rob or uh, Colonel Sutcher very soon. Uh, but we have dual challenges. So this dual challenge, and uh, I would commend everybody go back and look at the problem statement and the strategy to really get a sense of what we're talking about, which is in the day to day, we need to prevail in competition. And simultaneously, we have to modernize our force. And that's what this is about modernizing the future force uh, to be both lethal but and distributed and to integrate a lot of new s systems. Well, they aren't new, but they're just not really well integrated. Uh, and to combine that with a force that is well trained and flexible and thoughtful and, and resilient uh, as we become more dependent on incredibly networked systems, uh, we're also very mindful of the fact that our potential adversaries have the ability to deny us some of, the, some of those networks. And uh, we need to theorize how we're going to do both high tech and low tech at the same time and, and how we're going to train our people to live in that kind of world. And with that, I will <laughs> uh, I will uh, hand off to Colonel Sutcher to talk about the modernization and employment. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I'd like to also echo the sentiments of my two colleagues. Thanks uh, to Admiral Rando and, and uh, Captain, uh, Colonel Pugh and uh, Captain Sunval uh, for uh, bringing us on here and talking to everybody. It's, it's so important to have this discussion, so important to present this and talk about this to as many people as we possibly can. It's, uh, the, strategy, the strategy has been out for about six weeks now, and as we continue to go on our virtual roadshow, because we've uh, been prevented from going on the, the quite extensive uh, physical roadshow that we had originally planned when we started this. I think uh, any opportunity we have to speak and ask questions and getting a little bit better understanding is, is important. So certainly, as uh, I try to tie it up in these last two slides, this is uh, kind of takes the, the points that have been brought together so far and really wraps the, wraps the bow around the package and, and hopefully you'll buy exactly what we're selling because we think this is a very important concept and an important strategy for our services. If you read the introduction, as it said, this is a strategy that we're looking at in the next decade, which will shape uh, for many uh, decades to come. So as we talk about employing the force, <clears throat> I encourage you to look at the, the bang box right at the, uh, at the bottom and uh, keep that in mind. It's already been talked about uh, a couple times just to reiterate on this of how much we've looked and how much time we've spent on the competition continuum. For those of you that uh, uh, don't have the dubious privilege of working in the Pentagon, uh, recently there is a joint doctrine note on competition continuum. And right now the joint staff is working on a competition concept. So competition is really taking 
the forefront of all of what we do. And that's uh, as we've looked at it from day to day to crisis to conflict. Uh, so something we consider it all the way through. And for those Marines that are listening in, if uh, you're not aware, there's a new Marine Corps doctrinal pub, one TAC four, which is competing, which kind of goes across the same thing. So as I start talking about the employment, Captain Colt mentioned early on that uh, two of the three members of the Naval Service uh, do not uh, employ the force themselves by their service chiefs. Uh, but certainly what we want to present is how we have uh, developed that force and then how we envision the employment of the force, because we're the ones that the service headquarters with that Title X responsibility to, uh, to create a force and present it for those combatant commanders to employ. So as we uh, started off here, we, we recognized the importance and uh, how our competition with the PRC over other challenges. That doesn't mean that uh, the other challengers are non-existent, but it, it absolutely focuses what we're doing with uh, China, the, the Navy, the Air, our Army, the, the rocket force, and how we look at that uh, across the board. Uh, next, as we, we look at uh, confronting malign behavior, and that doesn't mean that we're going to stop everything that will happen. We're not uh, saying that, but we're going to look at ways of doing this, maybe new and uh, innovative ways of doing this. And while it may not be too innovative for a number of people trying to get our services to use Twitter and showing stuff along the lines like flyovers by Russian jets or uh, close calls by Chinese ships, this is something that absolutely uh, we want to confront that uh, malign behavior and, and where we can minimize that tactical of risk, but, and then also take a more assertive uh, posture that uh, across the board. For, uh, for those of you that look at the, that read the intelligence reports, that this has uh, had significant impacts on uh, uh, China right now and how they've looked at. They are wondering what the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy is going to do and how we're going to act to it. So certainly across the board, knowing uh, our, our fleets that are out there, our uh, forces that are forward deployed, uh, having them understand this is, is very important. And then uh, the, the last priority, uh, focusing on future warfighting readiness over midterm or near-term demand. Uh, you hear that said a lot of times, but I think this is really important. As Captain Kolb showed you in that sand chart early on, uh, the growth of the, the Chinese Navy uh, it is absolutely important that we don't miss uh, what is in farther down the road for just trying to figure out what's happening today. If you take a look at the right side of the screen, and it, it really is uh, right side of the slide there. This really is how we plan on operating across the competition continuum. For those uh, for those in the Navy that know Vice Admiral Munch, he uh, affectionately called this the five barrel revolver. It gives us a number of different pieces and parts to, to choose from. So which tool do we want to use? Which bullet do we want to use in the arsenal as we go through here? And once again, across the uh, competition continuum. I think one question's already been asked. Uh, for example, what do we do differently to integrate our allies and partners in our wartime capabilities? Well, that is certainly important. That is definitely not uh, not the only way of operating across the competition continuum. Strengthening those alliances and partnerships early, uh, getting the the right people uh, to do the right things, and having that across the board is certainly important. So, as we look at that, uh, it is. Uh, competition is the day-to-day -day crisis and conflict. So uh, without going through those again, because uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. And uh, certainly, as you see the green circle around the entire piece, uh, the, the ally and partner contribution is uh, and collaboration is important across the board. So uh, that next slide, please. Developing the force, this is... Uh, this is what, what the bread and butter is of the service headquarters. This is what we do in DC. This is what we try to do with our forces and this is how we try to get them ready. And then also what we do with those uh, operational forces, those fleets, those uh, areas, uh, Coast Guard districts that certainly go out there and, and get our forces ready. So if you see on the left side of that slide also, uh, the priorities here, uh, we're looking at those, uh, these our lines of effort, that we prioritize to make sure that we're relevant across the competition uh, continuum. What can we do 
so that it's just not a one-trick pony. Perfect example of this, for those of you that may have, uh, may have heard the joint warfighting concept that's continuously in development right now, we want to make sure that that is just as applicable during competition as it is in conflict. So that's one example. Our emphasis on sea control that we've talked about uh, previously, uh, relative to other naval missions, we understand that the importance of sea control, getting back to that over something, for example, of power projection. Uh, looking at greater numbers of distributed capabilities and look at how we do those. One example is the introduction of the law. Certainly a smaller ship with uh, some capability, but uh, we have a lot more of those out there. Uh, integrated naval modernizations. We've talked about it a few times where we talked about, uh, where Kate talked about modernizing the future force and how important that is. And then education and training for a warfighting advantage. I think if you've read uh, the document, you see that that's one of the first things that we list. So uh, certainly a, uh, a key point. And so as I go onto the right side of the, the screen here into that Pentagon shape, uh, got, uh, graphic, what I'll talk about is a couple examples. And I'll start off with training and education because it is so important. And, and certainly the audience that we have here uh, today, this afternoon, tonight. Looking at some of our distributive training, whether it would be in live virtual construction, uh, constructive, large scale exercises, degree programs, uh, any of those things that we can get smarter and uh, educate ourselves better so that when we when we don't have uh, always the number of reps and sets that we come there to the force better and well uh, more prepared. Looking at our capabilities and networks, uh, look at how our naval operational architecture looks at unmanned ISR, uh, intermediate force capabilities, how we integrate those across the, the uh, competition continuum, our plans, exercises, and experiments, how we look at integrated formations how uh, probably for the first time in a long time, we're starting to, uh, a Marine could actually tell somebody in the Navy what the echelon of command means, having uh, understanding composite warfare, putting those pieces together so we truly are an integrated force, uh, understanding our own C2 constraints and where we need to work, and then incorporating our allies and partners into all that. So a lot of work to be done there, certainly good, uh, good pieces that we continue to improve on. Analysis and wargaming, understanding those key operational problems that we need to have. That's an effort that we started. Uh, as, uh, as we've said, both uh, Captain Culp and Commander Higginsbloom have said a couple of times, we were struck in the middle of this by COVID, and we kind of had to put our uh, classified strategy on hold and develop more of a, uh, an unclassified strategy, knowing full well where some of our uh, classified pieces would go. And we knew that our key operational problems would be one of the first places we want to get to as we go into the, the, this secret document. Our investments in innovation, what are we looking at? So some next generation communications, certainly artificial learning, uh, teaming and unteaming, quantum computing, all these things where certainly are, are areas where we know that this, uh, the area is ripe for investment, ripe for ex uh, expansion, and something our service chiefs could feel pretty strongly about. And then our force design. When you're tying all those things together, I think a number of people understand that the Marine Corps is going through a pretty significant force design, and uh, uh, this strategy absolutely, absolutely is in line with it. In fact, our Commandant just spoke to a, uh, a large synchronization IPT yesterday, and uh, talking about competition was one of his keys. We need to have a force that's ready for competition all the way through conflict. And we're looking at a force design that's the three services with an agile mobile, scalable, sustainable, versatile, and networked uh, force across the board. So with that, I will turn it to, I believe, Captain Sunvald, and uh, we look forward to answering as many of your questions as we can. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, very informative to, to us and the audience, I'm sure, and we <clears throat> the questions are rolling in here pretty hot and heavy. So. Let's get after it. I'll pose the first one to Captain Culp. Um, do you believe the advantage of C strategy contains sufficient guidance to assign resources or in these constrained financial times or not to assign resources to ensure we have an ends, ways, and means alignment? 
All right. Thanks. Thanks, Captain Sunvold. Uh, so first of all, I think it's important to keep in mind that Advantage at Sea is one of several documents where I think this guidance exists. And this being the tri-service strategy, it's really the umbrella that covers a lot of the individual service guidance. So the goal of the strategy was to really set what are the main priorities for the three services together? What do we need to prioritize? Um, certainly there is not enough resources to do all of the things we would like to do. We certainly just, we can't build our way. We can't generate enough capacity or capability um, to the point that that's, that's the only solution. So integration is one of our solutions to do this. If you can better integrate the Navy Marine Corps Coast Guard together, you sort of get a, a whole is greater than some of its parts approach by leveraging all the, the capabilities and authorities of those three services together. That said, a lot of hard choices are going need are, are uh, need to be made moving forward, particularly because we don't actually know what the future budget environment is going to look like. Um, COVID certainly is going to affect that. Um, the new Congress is, you know, we, we, a lot of question marks remain. So, bottom line is, we will not have enough resources to be everywhere and do everything we want to do. What we tried to do with the strategy was to set those main priorities, to think about competition with China needs to be primary in our mind as we employ the force. It's not that other threats aren't important, but we need to think about operations that aren't directly competing with China, treat those as opportunity costs, um, force development efforts that are only designed towards one element of that competition continuum are less uh, advantageous to us than capabilities that are applicable across the competition continuum. So it helps us set some of those priorities, but ultimately the whole job of the three services and some of the specific guidance is how do we spread out the risk of what we cannot afford to do? How do we balance that risk? Some of that we balance out over time, some of it we balance out regionally. Um, and those hard choices, I think, uh, it's not necessarily appropriate to put all of those in an unclassified document. This provides the broad umbrella, uh, but those hard choices, I think, are made in real time. They're iterative. They're based on the interactions with our competitors, and the security environment is constantly changing. So I think Advantage at C provides the broad umbrella. It provides the right priorities, and it's up to our leadership to help make some of those hard decisions moving forward based on those interactions. Awesome, thank you very much. Over to Colonel Pugh. Yeah, thanks. Lots of uh, maybe budget questions that we'll come back to. This uh, this idea that a vision without uh, resources is a hallucination. So, uh, you know, how do uh, three services with three separate budgets all agree to cooperate and like shifting money around either within a service uh, to different capabilities that haven't been priorities maybe in the past, uh, but maybe in the future or even transferring money I think I remember, maybe it was uh, uh, General Max, I can't remember that was talking about transferring money to the Department of State, like, here, take some DOD money because you're killing us. Like, you know, we have to do all the work, you know, uh, treating the patient if we don't do any uh, preventative medicine on the front end. So that's the question I was gonna ask uh, to whoever uh, on the team wants to, to, to field it is about the partners and allies question. And really it's about, you know, what, what does that mean because uh, when, when, uh, if you don't have a lot of intermediate capabilities or you know, non-lethal weapons or the kind of the policing and the law enforcement, you know, the rule of law and order kind of capabilities uh, in the Navy or Marine Corps, you know, we train our partners and allies to look you know, a lot like us kind of thing. So how do you see the uh, interaction with partners and allies through theater security cooperation or other mill-to-mill -mill events, those kind of things? Uh, is it so that they can stand on their own two feet and police their own backyard, you know, prevent fires from breaking out in their own backyard? Is it to be uh, interoperable with uh, U.S. forces uh, or is it to be part of this integrated force where, they, you know, they don't replicate what we have, uh, but we have complementary capabilities that come together in certain uh, theaters or uh, you know, areas of conflict when when required to be, you know, again, you know, greater than some of its parts. Does that question make sense? Anybody want to take that one? I, I'll take a stab at it. I may I may have misunderstood the question, but I'm going to answer the question I thought I heard. So um, I what I would say is it all depends and it's 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 a grab bag of all of those kinds of partnerships and allies, which is where the integrated force is so important. Uh, the Coast Guard, based on its size and its mission profile, 
is really the partner of choice for many, many nations and many states that are not the ideal partner for the Navy or the Marine Corps. And that's fine. I mean, that's that's part of what an integrated force is about. But there are points where interoperability or the new word interchangeable that I've been hearing um, is is desirable, but it's just not feasible for every single country that you engage with to expect that level. Um, but the vast majority of, of, not the vast majority of the resources, the time I would say could go to states that really need to learn how to police their own backyard, as you say, but also to build the good governance structures to make them resistant to coercive activity and malign influence. I mean, really information management and the ability to share knowledge is such an important part of that countering malign activity that, you know, forget whether or not they have, you know, F-35s. Can we share information with them so that they can go arrest uh, Chinese-sponsored poachers? That's that's kind of the partnership area that that is ripe for more development. Um, as to the high-end partners, I'll leave that uh, to my my Pentagon brothers over there. But those those will continue to be incredibly important and vital. Um, they they have always been that way, and they will be even more so in the future. I think those are all great points, and just you know the Chinese cabbage strategy, where you have, you know. It's great. There's just an illegal fisherman, and just behind that is a Chinese Coast Guard boat, and just behind that is a PLAN, you know, Luyang or whatever. That uh, you know, the, the uh, escalation of force you can see it laid out to the horizon, and so you yeah. think twice about you know driving the poacher off your land or whatever. And so we have to have that same ability to to escalate and de-escalate, uh, you know, below the threshold of war as above as well as above the threshold of war to uh, to, to counter that. I think so. I thought those are great points. I, I, if I could, uh, for Colonel Sutter, I would say, you know, the Marine Corps in the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy and the Commandant's Planning Guidance, I'm uh, talking about uh, new missions for the Marine Corps, sea control, you know, sea denial, uh, you know, supporting those things, fighting at sea and from the sea was one of the lines that took me back you know, when I saw it the first time. Uh, what are the implications for partners and allies uh, on the Marine Corps side or from the Marine Corps perspective, you know, looking at it through the lens of this new strategy? Good, Pew. I think that's a good, an absolutely great question. Something that uh, a lot of times uh, Marines, me being an infantry officer for 25 years so far now, uh, something that, that saying fighting at sea is not something that uh, I grew up doing. I did my last MU was in uh, 99 and 2000 and to understand how how well we integrate with the Navy and how uh, we integrate or interchange with the uh, Coast Guard so important. As we look at this, one of the things I would say is, once again, we prioritize the PRC over other uh, competitors. And uh, as we look at that, uh, we recognize this is a competition across the board and, and the way you succeed in this competition is working with those allies and partners and our, our other uh, Naval Service uh, brothers and sisters. So uh, as, as we've been going through understanding each other's service and how we can best work together, we know that, uh, for example, the Coast Guard's got uh, uh, agreements with 60 nations or 61 nations that, uh, that the other services that they don't want to have agreements with the military, yet the Coast Guard and, and the role that they play they're able to do uh, some great things that that add to it. So when when they can come in there, and the Coast Guard starts helping them to police, as, as Kate said, police their shores, uh, that just opens up the invitation. Well, what else can you do? What what else can you bring besides just this capability of the Coast Guard? That was a great thing, and now we want more. Uh, and and what it what it does for us is that as we look at how we operate in competition, it only sets us up for crisis and conflict. Uh, I think uh, we wrote in the, the, the strategy, we come, uh, we, we deploy prepared for anything, or we deploy with our kit that's uh, that not knowing what's going to happen. Well, as, as we've seen through a lot of our analytical rigor that's been done, not just what we did for the Trash Service Maritime Strategy, but for the force design that the Marines going through, and uh, the, the Navy that just recently finished the Future Force Naval Study, 
we have to be inside our adversary's OODA loop and also their ability to shoot. So we know that being inside that first island chain adds resolve to our our uh, our allies and partners. Being there with them, alongside of them, and working with them, if if we we put those uh, we put ourselves with them, we they'll they'll be there. We'll strengthen their backs, and that's what we want to do in competition. And they'll only pay us dividends in crisis and conflict if we need. Uh, great, great response, and Captain Sunvold, I apologize. Uh, one more on the partners and allies while we're on the topic rather than bounce back to it because there were a bunch of questions uh, that came through in the chat about that. And I think, you know, for uh, for the foreign area officers and the regional area officers where this is kind of like a boutique skill maybe, you know, in the services where you go off and you're a naval attache somewhere or a MARA, uh, do, you, do you see this? Maybe it's a question for you, uh, Captain Colt and Captain Sutcher. You know, do you see this as um, adding, uh, you know, a new level of importance and priority to Rayos and Feos, so that they're not necessarily working, you know, a desk back at Paycom or Marvel Pack or something, uh, but they're, you know, out on the front lines, you know, interacting with our partners and allies on a more regular basis, which implies more capacity and authorities and, and things like that. So maybe, uh, how about we go with you first, Captain Sutcher, and then Captain Colt, just to keep the flow. Sure. Well, um, so a week ago, Indo-PACOM requested a significant number of additional RAOs and FAOs, uh, citing not only uh, the Commandant's force design, but also the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy about why they why we need more RAOs and FAOs and where they would the, the best do it, uh, best pay dividends. So, uh not that uh, the commandant's approved this yet, and, and certainly something we may want to flip out of the the, the recorded version, but uh, uh, we are seriously looking at uh, where we need to increase our rayos and feos. And uh, as you can imagine, as we as we do grow that capability, the first place it's going to be put is in the Indo-Pacific region. So 100% agree. Yeah, and I would add... I won't comment on necessarily the need need for more, but absolutely the comment on the the, the importance of them because certainly nations, you know, pieces of land don't have relationships between them. It's it's really all about the people. So at the atomic level, the 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 FAOs are sort of the atomic level of that relationship. Those individual relationships between the people on the ground in that nation and back here in the United States really do uh, build those relationships and build those alliances. So. We see those as a as critical to this strategy, particularly when you talk about, you know, how is it that you can tie in the alliances and partnerships, not just in one area of the strategy. Of, hey, we're just trying to build relationships, but we're really trying to achieve unity of effort in the employing the force. Uh, we see areas where alliances and partnerships, or the allies and partners, are going to take the lead on strengthening alliances and partnerships because they have the ability to. Um, reach out to nations that may be uncomfortable cooperating or you know, having Marines on the ground or cooperating with a Greyhold Navy ship um, that another nation may not have that same uh, issues with. Um, and we see them, as you know, we've kind of talked about a number of times, executing operations on their own in addition to alongside of us, but also leading some. And that also goes into the force development piece. In order to have that interoperability or ideally interchangeability someday, you can't just do that from the day you deploy forward. You have to start back in the force design, force development process uh, to build that. So um, all of those relationships are, are are key. And I think the FAOs really underpin those alliances and partnerships in the day to day. I'll turn it over to Kate. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as Beaker said, uh, the importance of those relationships, the Coast Guard doesn't have FAOs, uh, but we have FAO like officers. We're all line officers. So we sort of, you go at your own risk and become sort of an expert in international things, uh, but the demand has exploded and there are partners everywhere um, from Denmark to Australia and then uh, across the Indo-Pacific where we are placing more officers and, and we cannot meet the demand at this point whatsoever. But I also wanted to reiterate something that was just said about the roles of allies and partners in pulling those alliances and partnerships forward themselves which is uh, holding up the leadership efforts of our allies and partners, particularly countries like Australia and Japan and France that also have really 
active leadership roles in these really priority theaters, it is it is vital for us to make it clear that this is not the United States versus China, but that this is a, a system in a, a community of, of like-minded states that are acting together to build these. And so not necessarily always focusing on US-led uh, forums and partnerships, though those are important, but really lifting up and coordinating with our partners. Um, a lot of the work that we've been doing in Oceania is, is really in partnership with the Australians, making sure essentially they don't show up with boats one week and we show up with different boats the next week, um, but, but really coordinating those efforts as well. Uh, really great points. And Dan, before I hand it back to you, I just said, you know, the, sometimes you have a cathartic event like Iraq and Afghanistan or whatever. When it's over, you're like, oh, thank God that's over. We're never doing that again. But it seems like a lot of the things, you know, that we're le learning to eat soup with a knife or whatever, like all those hard won lessons. Uh, while the generation we've turned over the Navy and Marine Corps and the Coast Guard, you know, three times since the end of that, you know, because we rotate so fast. Like, I think we systemically or organizationally learned those lessons uh, and we'll be, you know, prepared next time, not perfectly prepared, but much better prepared than we were for Iraq and Afghanistan to uh, to integrate partners and allies and to fight an away game, you know, on on a on a you know another country's, um, you know, home field or whatever, and be able to do that with culture and interoperability and, you know, appreciation for what they bring and don't bring kind of thing to the fight. So. Congratulations for uh, for what you've been able to weave throughout this document. Dan, over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Colonel Pugh. Um, <clears throat> great discussion, great uh, point by Colonel Sutcher on the uh, the value of the Coast Guard alongside the Navy. I mean, look at, at Bahrain and, and Fifth Fleet and what the WPBs and PCs and MCMs have been do doing over there for a couple decades now. So, uh, but shifting gears a little bit, um, we got another question from the chat. So I think this one uh, is for Colonel Sutcher. Uh, question is, Commander Higginsbloom noted the forced restructure and increased need for forced projection from the United States Marine Corps, which seems to be in line with the Commandant's planning guidance. She also noted the need of a, of a, for a larger Coast Guard force. Does this strategy discuss, or is there any talk of, Marine Corps forces training or integrating with the Coast Guard to increase our proficiency supporting sea control, sea denial, and otherwise operating in the littorals. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely think it does. I think uh, as we've looked at these capabilities and we look at uh, our, our area that we're focused on, uh, as, as we know, the first and second island chain is, is Swiss cheese to be, uh, to probably give a good way of uh, considering that. And we have to be able to work alongside each other. We have to be forward deployed. We have to be in there. Uh, the Marine Corps is uh, tasked to be the contact and blunt layer force. We're tasked to be the stand-in force. We've got to integrate ourselves across the board. I, I think uh, that, that question also ties to another one that was asked about uh, budgeting and Palm and how, we're, how we integrate with the Navy on that and how do we make sure our three services are kind of aligned on some of these. Uh, without a doubt, it's, it's easier to give an answer for that one uh, with the Marine Corps and the Navy, as we've seen in the past uh, two uh, cycles of budgeting that I've been a part of in this one already, uh, where we're making sure our capabilities are coming in on uh, in line with each other and at the right time with the right capabilities so that we're not developing one thing that's going to sit in it alongside a pier or uh, sit there waiting for Marines to get on. Uh, and the Navy just taking, uh, just trying to make sure that it's just uh, not going to rust while Marines are developing a capability. And then how do we make sure those capabilities come together with C2, which I think uh, uh, Captain Culp could really talk about well, the C2 initiatives that we've got going on within our services. But how do we make sure that each of the services have those C2 capabilities that come in at the right time so we don't have to, once one of the services has those, we don't modernize it too quickly with the other one not even catching up. So I think absolutely, if we're not integrating ourselves, and we really are, if we're not doing that uh, well, uh, we can, we'll can we see serious gaps in our capabilities to, uh, to be able to go after that pacing threat. All great points. Thanks very much for that. Uh, over to Colonel Pugh again. Uh, thanks. So, uh, so since you brought up the, uh, the C2 question, I will ask 
this detailed question from the chat. So everybody uh, just hang on a second as uh, I will read it for those that uh, they can't see the chat. And then uh, Captain Culp, I'll ask you to go first and then uh, and then the other two uh, panelists or, or presenters. So the question is, uh, starts with a statement and then gets to the question. I agree that potentially malign strategic efforts by China and Russia need to be thwarted by increasing the risk of tactical efforts to prevent them. Escalation potential from these tactical prevention measures implies that rules of engagement will have lots of branches and sequels. Mission command is a requirement here, but if the COCOM wants to make the final decision on such tactical operations, then that implies a C2 system requirement that may not be able to be met in a D-DIL environment. What does the tri-service strategy imply for C2 processes and systems? Unspoken here, I think, is nuclear weapons, um, but certainly, you know, that escalation of force that spins out of control is uh, when some in a comms denied environment is, uh, I think, a challenge. Over to you, Matt. All right. Thanks very much. You know, I think it's a it's a terrific question in the sense that I mean, absolutely right. Command and control is going to underpin a lot. It's really the challenge of our time moving forward. You know, particularly like as you move to a distributed, an increasingly distributed force, an increasingly distributed operations, somehow linking these uh, these platforms, these people uh, all together is absolutely critical. Uh, certainly, if you're trying to maintain. Uh, that close command and control in uh, an escalatory environment like we, we think we're probably going to face. So what does the strategy address about that is um, it, it highlights it as one of the key areas where we, we need to get this right. This is echoed by the CNO in his NAV plan as really one of his top priorities is to deliver on what we call the naval operational architecture, which is the uh, it's the it's the networks, it's the the battle management aids, it's the data standards, it's the infrastructure that allows all of our forces to operate together. Uh, and so he's highlighted that as really one of the key main priorities for us moving forward. Um, I think the strategy also addresses it in the sense that. Uh, again, this is not something that we can do from the day you deploy forward. You, we need to start building this and building this interoperability um, and integration from the ground up now uh, so that we're not trying to uh, have incompatible systems suddenly talk to each other, but they're built compatibly uh, from the ground up. So ideally, uh, you know, all this will be nested under this idea of JADC2, the Joint All Domain Command and Control that certainly the joint force is all working towards where you have this, so the, the vision of you know, it, it linking together sensors and shooters and platforms, sort of agnostic to what they are, but everything can kind of see a, a common picture. Um, all that said, that, that's, that's the dream. We need to recognize that this will be a challenging environment. Cyber attacks, electromagnetic spectrum denial, all kinds of things make, make that extremely challenging, which I think will be one of the fundamental advantages the US military has is that mission command mindset. We have creative people who are out there who can make independent decisions um, and operate effectively in the dark. Um, and so we need to continue that culture and we need to you know, avoid that 10,000 mile screwdriver um, mindset where the, the COCOM has complete control. He needs to be able to delegate those decisions. Um, and for institutions like the Naval Postgraduate School, where you do have people with this incredible technological savvy and creativity, that's where the intellectual horsepower is gonna come from to solve these problems. How will we do this? How can we crack this nut? Um, certainly a lot of uh, intellectual push-ups and stubby pencil work it remain to, to make sure we can make this happen. Um, and I think that's why I, I feel very happy about the ed educational institutions we have because we're building those people who can solve those problems um, as we move forward. All right, great answer, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if the other two, if somebody wanted to weigh in, I was just, you know, just contemplating, uh, you know, the C2 challenges, just looking at cat of cliff relationship and how complex that can be uh, for the Navy and Marine Corps to do expeditionary operations or uh, amphibious operations. And now you've rolled in the Coast Guard and now you've rolled in partners and allies, potentially partners and allies that come and go, you know, different ones, depending uh, where you are and what the circumstances are. So there's both a systems problem and then there's a cultural maybe issue, you know, the flexibility of uh, systems and the flexibility of thought 
uh, both will be required in the future to uh, to be able to kind of shape shift as you need to do this hy hybrid force, hybrid Coast Guard, Marine Corps, and uh, Navy, but also hybrid with partners and allies. Um, great. Uh, I don't know, Commander Higgins Bloom or uh, Colonel Sutcher, did you want to weigh in on C2 or avoid the whole thing? Like, like, uh, <laughs> I, I think just uh, one. <laughs> Yeah, that, well, you know, I think this is a, a very great topic that uh, we're continuing to uh, to understand. Uh, once again, uh, to, for the for the Marines to be able to speak the naval language, uh, to do that more and understand what a, a, a whiskey or a tango or a zebra command, uh, as uh, Captain Sunwald said, uh, we see the we see the integration that we had in the Middle East with uh, Fifth Fleet and how everybody has to play together in such a small area, you have to understand those. Now, when you start putting composite warfare together, you start putting in, uh, you know, putting more Marines on the GIFMEX staff and, and getting the, the Marine Corps to be able to understand what the theater GIFMEX does and to get the Navy to understand uh, what uh, some service guys or sub guys to understand what Marines do as part of that uh, fight that we can help in that sea control to get everybody better educated on this is absolutely critical. And to tie in our, our Coast Guard, our Coast Guardsmen in this so that we're, we're really capitalizing on the strengths that we all bring together. This is certainly something that our, our day to day exercises, uh, we really need to do well and we need to do often. Uh, I think history has shown us when you rehearse these plans time and time again at our schools and everybody knows it from the time they were an ensign or a lieutenant all the way to now where they're admirals and generals, it shows how strong we are when we, when we end up executing them. This is going to take uh, years, if not decades, to make sure that we're incredibly proficient with something we need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Captain Sundell, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we'll keep rolling with questions kind of tied in with C2. Um, uh, as we've uh, we've seen over the last year or so, a lot more um, lead debt deployments to Southcom on, on, on gray hull ships from both the East and West Coast. And this uh, question from the chat is along those lines. So in an era of competition, will we leverage the Coast Guard Title 14 authorities more extensively worldwide? Are there proposals to put Coast Guard debts on U.S. Navy ships, then shift tap, tack on to a Coast Guard flag when Title 14 is required from a gray hull? Or does this mean more deployments for the Coast Guard? I think that one is for you, uh, Commander higgins I, I think so. Uh, yes, so the leadets have really uh, moved up in the world from when I was an ensign, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> they never knew they were going to be so popular. Uh, yes, so there, there will be more lead at detachments. They're incredibly affordable and easy to do and really leverage um, our built in strengths. So one of the things that's unique about the Coast Guard is there is no garrison force. You know, those we don't spend years training to be law enforcement officers so that we can go on lead ads. You spend a few years, you know, doing counter narcotics missions or boarding fishermen as a coastie uh, in the United States. And then we just take you and plop you over in fifth fleet or on on a gray hall and and that's a so you have a lot of competence so it's easy for us to build those teams along with all of the other training teams and they won't just be on gray halls they'll be on allied and partnerships we already have coast guardsmen and coast guard women out on um uk dutch uh, and australian ships right now along with many of our other partners in the indo-pacific and that's one of the places where you know you really can't use Title 14 everywhere as much as we'd like to think that. Uh, so a lot of the time it's us uh, providing the training and enabling or us providing the platform for a shipwriter from another nation to exercise their authorities, almost sort of a reverse lead at. So you'll see a lot more of that. But the question about deployments is really an interesting one. So for the Coasties in the room, they know that by 2030, we're going to have a fleet of cutters that can go a lot farther and do a lot more uh, than any previous fleet, as you would hope. Uh, but there's a question about where they're going to be. And, and that's really one of the big takeaways from Advantage at Sea for us is this the idea of a competition Coast Guard and that uh, 
uh, we are meeting demand signals. In some ways, we're codifying meeting de demand signals that were already coming in outside of the, the regular GFM process. Some asks were direct from the White House uh, and others were, were from other sources for us to continue to go to places like the Gulf of Guinea, Oceania, uh, a lot of places in the Western Hemisphere and in the Arctic uh, to do this sort of competition work. And so this represents a change for us as far as rather than treating each one as an ad hoc or this is the one time we're going to do it, this is an acknowledgement that this is an enduring competition. And so there won't be more deployments, but they will be different deployments. And it'll be interesting to see where those uh, those long term commitments sort of shape up uh, as we implement the strategy. I think I answered the question. Yeah, it's uh, some great insight there. Um, it, it, good points on, you know, we don't know what they're going to look like and it's going to be, it's going to evolve. And uh, the the acknowledgement that this is kind of a kind of long term game here and it's not just a short term thing. I think that's that's important for people to understand. So yeah, great. Thanks very much. So back over to you, Colonel Pugh. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the, so the next question comes from, I think, probably our Naval Special Warfare and uh, MARSOC uh, brothers and sisters, and that is about the role of special operations in the strategy. And in general, I think the maritime great power competition. So uh, how about uh, Colonel Sutcher? You want to take that one? Sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about that one. We, we had a, as we were developing the strategy, we had a uh, a number of long discussions. We did have uh, some NSW uh, individuals as well as MARSOC uh, individuals come in there, and we had some good pieces that, that hit on this. And you know, certainly, uh, there's there's a time and a place for everything. There's there's great capabilities that they will be able to bring into the fight. Um, and and once again, I'll start with that competition piece. How do we how do we bring that capability? Uh, to to some of our allies and partners, and how do we incorporate them? How do we train with them and work with them to open that door when we need we need the ability to uh, have that ISR platform, whether it be uh, just uh, the individual uh, soft guy on the ground, or how do they incorporate all these things together? So uh, our strategy, if, if uh, you do the Google search on there. There, uh, we do mention our, our soft counterparts in there. Uh, we think we, uh, without going too deep in, in our uh, uh, capabilities that we want to have in uh, with them, we made sure that, uh, that that they're bringing a lot to the fight. And they certainly do, not only with their training, but also their ISR capabilities. And then once we actually need them uh, to execute some of the, the, the denial missions that uh, we know that they'll need to do. So certainly a huge role that we can see them play. Uh, thanks very much. I don't know if uh, Commander Higgins Bloom or Captain Culp have anything else to add. I would just say, you know, it is uh, again kind of whatever. I I tip back and admire this this whole approach because it shows the evolution of uh, SOF moving out of Iraq and Afghanistan and the and the global war on terrorism and the missions that they've been doing. And, and basically, you know, evolving or, or morphing themselves into this new role, not forgetting all the lessons that they've learned from those 25 years or whatever, uh, but incorporating that even, you know, into even a more sophisticated way uh, to get after their their kind of core missions, whether that's special reconnaissance, foreign internal defense, or uh, or direct action. So, uh, so thanks for that. I don't know, uh, Commander Haynes Bloom or Captain Culp, did you have anything to add? I'd like to get to a couple more questions, unless you have huge insights that you wanted to. OK, great. Uh, Captain Sunvald, over to you. OK, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so this question from Chad was uh, one, kind of mirrors one that I had when we were looking at this. But uh, from the chat, can you expand a bit on the vision of a hybrid force and how the naval force structure may change based on introducing a hybrid force? Uh, Captain Culp, over to you on that one. Sir. OK, thanks. Um, so I, I think it's important to note that certainly for the, the, the Navy in particular and in the Coast Guard, but you know, to some extent, the Marine Corps, you know, our platforms have very long service lives. So the service lives measured in decades for most of the Navy platforms. And so you know, realistically, a large portion of the fleet of 2030 is actually afloat today. 
Uh, and so we need to kind of pay that attention. So what the hybrid fleet is, is it's going to be a mix of existing platforms and then these future platforms that are coming down the pipe. Um, as we look at the security environment, we've, we've kind of discussed some of the implications of having this persistently Brazil, uh, uh, um, surveilled battle space and increasingly long range precision weapons that our competitors have that make uh, you know, area denial and make sea denial a, a really uh, Im important factor that we need to consider. So there's a variety of ways that I think our, our hybrid fleet of the future can achieve effects in such an environment. So um, if you sort of imagine the, you know, the Pacific as an example, um, you can operate in that and achieve effects in a few different ways. You, you can do it with really long range weapons. It's, it's, I'm, and I'm talking about if we go into a high end conflict. Uh, so you can achieve effects with long range weapons and just staying outside of uh, your adversary's ability to, to touch you. You can do it with essentially invisible forces, which is why we continue to rely on submarines, uh, because they can operate and essentially achieve effects without being targeted uh, essentially almost anywhere. Um, so you can do it by being invisible. You can do it by also being extremely defensible. It's hard to be on the right side of the cost curve with that approach, but if you can operate inside an adversary's weapon engagement zone and shoot down anything they throw your way, again, you can achieve effects in that way. And then another other way is that you can be completely expendable, uh, where you can just have enough platforms where it actually doesn't matter if you know they end up sinking these things or shooting them down because you have enough of them and you are on the right side of the cost curve for your adversary. So the point is with the hybrid fleet of it's some combination of all of those things. And so what we are trying to achieve now is what is the right balance. So the unmanned campaign plan that's going on right now is to help develop what are these unmanned platforms that we can rely on. Uh, we've talked about these future platforms coming down the pipe like uh, FFGX, uh, the light amphibious warship, uh, what's the right balance and mix of those. Um, and so the, the true answer is we don't yet know what the hybrid fleet will look like, but we have the, the ideas of it's some blend of these things and we're trying to optimize that blend right now and come up with the correct platforms. Um, and we really do need to get this right in this decade. So I would challenge everyone there at the Naval Postgraduate School that this is the work of analysis and wargaming, and it's a very important work that we have to do. A lot of that, you know, sort of stubby pencil work over the next five, five years or so to let's get the right blend of this. Uh, let's solve these networking problems. Let's find a way to integrate our forces to build these compatible systems so this, this approach will work. Um, and then, of course, there's all kinds of more material going on behind the scenes, but I, I'll leave it at that. It's sort of the this kind of unclassified broad brush level of it's that overall mix of platforms that optimizes our ability to achieve effects in almost any environment, um, particularly when you look at forward. But maybe the last thing I'll say is that uh, we need to continue to recognize how these disruptive technologies are really going to change the character of war moving forward and how rapidly the security environment might change. So how do we incorporate these emerging technologies at a much faster pace than we have in the past? And some of that's going to you know, involve potentially breaking down some of our systems of acquisition so that we can become a little bit more agile uh, with procurement, testing, exercising to field these, um, to field these platforms and capabilities sooner. Hey, thanks. Great, great answer. Um, I can tell you I've only been in this job for a month, but I know that the Naval Warfare Studies Institute is looking at a lot of what you've talked about and uh, a lot of discussions here at postgraduate school about what that uh, hybrid force may look like. So we're already on it. Uh, over to C Colonel Pugh, I think this is the final question. I, I, well, I did have more questions, but I kind of want to leave it where Captain Cole left it, which is, you know, the, the, the idea that uh, we have a lot of challenges to overcome, but uh, but I feel fully confident that we can overcome them because of the intellectual capital uh, that the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the Marine Corps is blessed with, that, uh, that we will figure this out. And uh, not only will we be prepared to win the next war, but we'll deter the next war because our adversaries uh, will, you know, we'll just see um, nothing but potential defeat in the, in the future. So uh, I won't ask another question. What I will do is, uh, is relay the offer that the uh, presenters made which is we'll, uh, too many questions to get to, and they're all like really great questions. I think the answers would be enlightening. And I also think for, uh, for the writing team going forward and anybody that works on the next stage of implementing this strategy, like these questions help tease out some of the things that need to be figured out in order to turn the vision into reality. 
So we'll uh, we'll send out an announcement and post it uh, on Twitter and Facebook and the MPS.edu site, et cetera, uh, where we'll have a uh, you know a blog where people can ask and uh, questions, and as the team has availability, uh, can can poke in some answers so that we can all be uh, smarter about what's in the strategy and potentially what isn't in the strategy that should be in the strategy. And with that, I would uh, like to say thank you to the uh, presenters uh, for your time late in the evening on uh, on the East Coast. And I will turn it back over for closing comments from Admiral Rondo. Thanks. Thanks, Colonel Pugh. You know, this was a great uh, hour and a half. Thinking about all the things that I wrote down on, on some notes here, the hybrid force is such an important area. Mission command, I mean, it's, it's in the KOPs and it certainly is something to be uh, thinking about really hard and see to and how we go about uh, addressing that. The notion about the naval uh, operational ar uh, architecture and bringing all those things together. And I thought that uh, Commander Higgins Bloom uh, comment that competition is an under theorized space is really provocative. And it was really good to hear about those kind of things. So this is great work. Uh, I also will tell you what Captain Sunvold said is that the Naval Warfare Studies Institute is looking at naval hybrid force as a year-long study for the NWSI Warfare Innovation Continuum and Captain Culp. We would be delighted to be able to work with you on that. We also have um, coming up, and I'm, I'm going to give a bit of an ad here if they will, if they'll bring up the slide for me. That um, when Captain, I mean, when Colonel Suture meant to, uh, mentioned quantum computing uh, as part of the force development uh, uh, aspect, we will be having a Nobel laureate uh, speaking with us at our second half guest lecture series, our, our next one. And I don't have the slide up, up here. Randy, do you have the uh, date and time on that by any chance? I'll, I'll get the slide up in a second. Yeah, thanks. So Dr. Bill Phillips uh, came, uh, is going to be speaking. He has lots of bones and an experience with O&R, and he's going to talk about quantum um, computing, and he's a Nobel laureate. We need to understand how the science and the technology come into warfighting. And this is really important to do. We cannot, we cannot outsource that. And so we look forward to that conversation. And again, Randy, it's fine. You'll be able to find it on our website, uh, the Nobel laureate, Dr. Bill Phillips. And I think we might get it up here soon. There, there you go. Uh, and again, thank you to the team for what you're doing. We offer our services to this entire team, and what a great hour and a half. Thanks to everybody for hanging in there on the East Coast. It's great to have you along on, on this journey with us. Uh, Randy, out here. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening, uh, morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. MPS out.